Hello and welcome to the 10th Adventure Film Podcast. This is the last of the 10 films we're doing. This one we're looking at, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad from 1974. Most of you have probably been listening to most of these, I hope. Um, But if not, here's a brief introduction. We're looking at classic adventure films and what makes them good adventures. What goes into making a good adventure, really. And we've looked at quite a few classics like King Kong, She, The Man Who Would Be King, to Lawrence of Arabia even. I'm Garen Ewing. I'm a comic artist. I've got an adventure comic called The Rainbow Orchid. And I'm discussing these films with my brother, Murray Ewing. Hello, I'm Murray. Uh, I write stories, uh, fantasy, science fiction, horror, things like that. And I have a blog called Musing. And so we're both very interested in story and adventure and yeah. fantasy. And talking of fantasy, this adventure film, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, is slightly different from the others, I think, in that it is more of a fantasy mm. than some of the others, although they've got yeah. fantastic... Yeah, like Time Bandits was quite fantastic. That's but true, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, although I mean, we've been kind of saying, you know, what is an adventure film? What's what, what makes it the genre of adventure rather than, say, fantasy or a war film or even a romance? Because they're all adventures of a kind Mm. and a lot of the others have been set in a real world setting and have been to do with going off on a quest of some kind Mm. but but making it different from something like Lord of the Rings where say fantasy may trump the genre of adventure in that case you know why would adventure be the primary category for a film (laughs) so this one is a good example of it's a fantasy, but it felt more like advent- enough like adventure that you yeah. could class it as an adventure. Yeah, so, so looking into why that is will be, will be a, an interesting thing. So The Golden Voyage of Sinbad was 1974 from Columbia Pictures, and it's the second Sinbad film made by Ray Harryhausen, who I'm sure most of you know, he's, he's most well known for his... Is it Dynamation? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's what the, he calls it, but it's yes. stop-motion animation. Stop-motion animation of... You know, creatures, especially dinosaurs, are his, his big thing. He was inspired by King Kong, which is our first film, the 1933 version, was the, the first adventure film podcast we did. Um, so that n- leads quite nicely to this, I think, mm. although his last film was Clash of the Titans. Yeah. Um, but this one, uh, Harryhausen said he'd made a lot of sort of monster on the rampage films, and this was something different. He's looking to myth and legend. Mm. Um, And it's the legend of Sinbad, which I mainly know from two things. One, I very vaguely, I don't know if you remember this, a cartoon from our childhood. And the only thing I remember is Sinbad the Sailor. In fact, maybe that's what it's called, Sinbad the Sailor. Yeah. Um, He had a belt and he'd tighten it and his upper body would, you know, expand. uh, Wouldn't there be flashes of lightning as well or something? Oh, there may have been. I I don't remember that. So it was kind of like Popeye, whereas Popeye would take spinach. spinach. Sinbad had the belt tightening (laughs) rather oddly. Um, not quite as a good message for children to eat your spinach but <laughs> anyway I think it gave him incredible strength and that was his power yeah very vague memory the other thing I mainly know Sinbad from although I do have the book of the tales I haven't actually read it yeah. I've had it a long time it's just um, I'm ashamed to say gathered dust <laughs> um, the other one is the Richard Corbin I think it's the last voyage of Sinbad last voyage of Sinbad yeah, yeah. 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 Um, um, and is that I think I'm right in saying that's framed by the 1000 and the Arabian Nights yeah I mean Richard Corbin does that uh, yeah Sinbad is is quite often associated with the Arabian Nights, but it's not actually in the original Arabic version of the Arabian Nights. The thing about oh, right, the Arabian right. Nights is it's got a very complex history. Yeah. And it's one of those things where all sorts of things get... It's just like a bag of stories. <laughs> Uh, but there are some really old manuscripts. Is, is which... the Arabian Nights that is an actual thing that existed yeah, yeah. with Shahrazad telling the tales? Yeah, yeah. There's Arabic uh, manuscripts which have that. Right. Um, so it's not a Western concocted. No, thing, no. Okay. But what happened in the West is when um, it was about in the 17, early 1700s, the Arabian Nights was translated into French was the first language it was translated right. in, in the West. It was really popular and it was called the 1001 Nights and people were calling for, you know, they, they really wanted more stories in the same vein. And one of the things they said was, you know, there aren't a thousand and one <laughs> nights worth. Right. Thousand and one <laughs> nights. Be a big book. The title. <laughs> just means a lot of nights you know right, okay. it means many like you might, like you said you know like you might say millions yeah or it something. might be millions yeah but you don't you mean it people said well there ought to be a thousand and one you know <laughs> and so they started collecting as many other oriental tales as possible so actual tales yeah the, right well they did that and when they ran out of them they invented them oh, okay and some <laughs> people just because you know this quite often happens with fantasy is that you'll discover the authentic ones yeah and people will get used to reading like that and then they'll start inventing their own just like when the Grimm, Grimm's fairy tales 
were popular. Shortly after that, people wanted more, so they started inventing them, and they all were set in Germany, oh, even right. though you know right. the Victorian because it's the tradition. Yeah, because that's oh, where Grimm's was set. Oh. But anyway, so Sinbad is an authentic tale from I think it's originally Syrian, maybe because I think that I read somewhere that Sinbad's name is Syrian, but um, it's sort of lumped in with the the Arabian Nights, as is, like, Aladdin, which is actually more Chinese. In is Aladdin now part of the Arabian Nights, then? Thing, well, or? it's sort of it generally was, thought to, it was but chucked in you know, like, there's, like, strict scholars of the Arabian Nights say no. Right, it's not but the it's, original... But it's become yeah. associated with it for so long that, you you know, even the, those scholars say, oh, well, we have to talk about this. Right, now, you know? yeah. <laughs> but, yes. Oh, OK. Oh, that's interesting. So, yes, as I say, I don't know much about Sinbad apart from the more recent uh, things. Um, I did read, actually, that the name may have some connection with India, as in the, you know, the Sindh and the, yeah. the Indus. That's it, yeah. It was uh, named after... It was, I think it means King of the Indus River or something oh, like that. Okay, I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah well, mm. uh, lost to time, maybe. So, anyway, he's a... Um, yeah, he is a character that uh, Harryhausen mm. went to, you know, from in myth and legend. But this is a, a made-up story. Yeah. I mean, his first Sinbad film was the seventh voyage of Sinbad. And Sinbad did have a number of voyages, mm. first, second, third, fourth, and all that. And this doesn't relate to the actual Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. No. That was a made-up story yeah, as well, yeah. although there are elements. Because in the actual Seventh uh, Voyage of Sinbad, uh, Sinbad discovers God and oh. <laughs> retires from adventuring. Oh, right, right. <laughs> oh, what's the point? <laughs> OK, so, um, I mean, that first Seventh Voyage of Sinbad was back in the late 50s, wasn't it? 1958, yeah. I think, or something. Anyway, but it was a big success. <laughs> and one of Harryhausen's favourite films was the 1940 version of The Thief of Baghdad. Mm. So that's a big influence and yeah as I say the first Sinbad film was a big success he then throughout the that was 50s throughout the 60s we had some of these sort of monster on the rampage films mm. and I think Valley of the Gwangi or Gwangi I'm not never sure <laughs> how you, what the correct pronunciation is was was a bit of a flop which oh, I'm right. quite surprised at because yeah. I, I really enjoy that film yeah um, uh, we've recently had a terrible film Cowboys versus aliens that this was cowboys versus dinosaurs <laughs> harry Housen did although his main thing was i mean he all started his films with concept sketches of mm. dinosaurs and fighting <laughs> people in in you know exotic settings and he had a, a story was built up around that yeah. but then he'd always get a script writer to make the story mm. you know make some kind of sense yeah it never feels just like a number of monsters connected by exactly that terrible <laughs> thing of saying oh you know uh, ninjas are really cool and cyborgs are really cool I know <laughs> cyborg ninjas alright that's it I've got my concept yeah. yeah who needs a plot uh, which happens all too often unfortunately I mean there is a bit of that with Harry Harryhausen because he is a fan yeah of this stuff and I think he's always remained that's one of the things that's quite nice about him in a way although he is a professional and he's produced quite a number of what are now classics there is still that kind of fan feeling about him mm. he just loves this stuff and that's quite nice so after he'd had a bit of a flop with Granji, he wanted to turn to something new instead of these monster on rampage films so that's why he went to legends right yeah i think he'd drawn well as i say he'd gone he, he went to his sketches that he'd always had and uh, in fact i've got a really good book i can't remember what it's called it, i think it's called the art of ray harryhausen actually mm -hmm. and i'd recommend it beautiful sketches in it and he's done a post he did a poster for something called <laughs> land of the genies or something oh, right. and that was a sort of sinbad versus dinosaurs <laughs> um anyway and anyway that changed into because yeah. there's no dinosaurs in this you are captain sinbad i am you are also a thief and a thief is a king until he is caught the bauble that hangs at your throat, Captain, is mine. Hand it to me, or you will have no throat. So, should we talk about the cast, yes, first of yes. all, to ease our way into the film? <laughs> so, Sinbad, yes. the main character, is played by John Philip Law, who I don't know. No. I mean, I've, I've seen, if you've seen Barbarella, you've seen him. He's in that. <laughs> he was in, apparently, over 100 films. Wow. But never really made it to ultra star status. But he's good in this, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, I think this is the only thing I recognise him from, but I've seen Barbarella, so maybe... He's actually the best of the three Sinbads, I think. Yeah. Um, although, not the others. The others aren't bad at all. Particularly mm. the first one, I quite like him as well. Oh, right. Although, he's more Middle Eastern in this one. Yeah. The first one's more Hollywood, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 
I seem to remember from Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. I remember after watching it thinking there's a couple of people who can really act and they stand out a mile, you know. <laughs> right. Um, in fact, um, Patrick Troughton is in that yeah. and um, Jane Seymour, who's got a really minor part. You know, you can tell she's acting properly. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Some of the more major characters, you just you know, wouldn't yes. expect. I haven't seen Eye of the Tiger for quite a long time. Like, yeah. After watching Golden Voyage again recently for this, I, I would like to see the, the yeah. Eye of the Tiger. It's been a while. So, well, talking of Patrick Troughton, who yes. was Doctor <laughs> Who, the other main character in Golden Voyage is Cora, yeah. who's an evil wizard. You wouldn't call him a wizard, would you? What would you call a Middle Eastern yeah. alchemist uh, type of thing? Sorcerer, maybe. Sorcerer, <laughs> that's a much better word. And he, anyway, he's played by Tom Baker. Yes who, of course, was the Doctor Who. Yeah, in the, fact... The proper Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> this was the film that got him the role as Doctor Who. Oh, right. Yeah. Because um, he was suggested to the producer at the time, might have been Barry Letts, I think, and they and he said, well, what can I see him in? Oh, he happens to be in the cinema at the moment in The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. And um, so he went and saw The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. Yeah, he's our man. <laughs> oh, right. That's interesting if they'd be able to tell that. Had he done many films before Well, no, in fact... Only a few, and in fact, in all of them, he seemed to be a bit typecast. He was originally in um, Laurence Olivier's National Theatre oh, right. company. and That's pretty prestigious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think he was doing major roles. The main thing I know about him from his early days is, was he a merchant seaman for a while? Because I've got this book on, mm. on how to use records at the National Archives, oh, and yeah. in the merchant seaman... I think this is right. <laughs> in the merchant seaman section, they've got Tom Baker's merchant seaman... Oh, right. um, card he might have been the main thing i remember him as being he was a monk he tried to be a monk for a oh, while God. So, <laughs> Which, so it was led to his role in rasputin yes yeah. <laughs> well olivier recommended him for rasputin right and he's got this look which you see in all his early roles where he <laughs> sort of bends bends forward and looks under his brow at you in a very hypnotic look with these bulbous eyes which you see quite a lot in golden yeah. voyage and uh, you see in that and then there was a bbc play of um uh, george bernard shaw thing where he played a foreign doctor right both of them they've got these shots it's almost like you have if you've got tom baker you've got to have this shot of him going <laughs> sort of leering <laughs> yes. hypnotically he didn't and, do that as doctor who did he um not as much and in fact that's interesting because those first three you almost seem to be typecast you know uh, Rasputin this foreign doctor and here he's the, yeah. the foreign sorcerer yeah. so all these quite dark roles so he, yeah. in fact he flipped over to be Doctor Who is a good role but one of the things he brought to it of course was a slight edge of darkness which yeah yes maybe yes. yeah and that wasn't the Hammer Rasputin, was it? Because no. I don't know when they made that, but there was one. Yeah, no, no. This was a this was quite a big budget. You know, a lot of big names in it. Right. Um, it wasn't Hammer then? Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, in fact, it was called Nicholas and Alexandra. He was only a minor oh, okay. role in it, really. Right. Uh, it wasn't. To... Ras- I think Rasputin the Mad Monk may have been the yes. Hammer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, talking of Hammer, the leading lady in this is Caroline Munro. Yeah. And she was in Hammer films. She was in. Was she in Captain Kronos, Vampire? Hunter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's a little after Golden Voyage. She was in James Bond for The Spy Who Loved Me. Mm. That was 1977. I mean, Cameron Monroe is good in this. Uh, she really is here for her looks, yes. uh, which are certainly to be admired. <laughs> but it's not a strong. Well, with quite a lot of these adventure films, there's not a lot of strong roles for women, and, yeah. and I think this is the case again. Although we'll talk about that later, perhaps. Um, but she was in um, At the Earth's Core as well, the mm. Pellucida, the Edgar Rice Burroughs yeah. uh, adaptation with Peter Cushing and Peter Cushing, yeah. what's his name? Blake with the chin. Uh, <laughs> what's his name? Now? Doug, Doug McClure. McClure. Doug McClure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The chin. Um, <laughs> that that suffered from not having Ray Harryhausen dynimation because yeah. it was men in suits, <laughs> rather ludicrous. Very stiff, rubbery suits. But it's a good it? film. It's yeah. still a good film, actually, yeah. amazingly. Yeah. You've, you've just got to, the monsters sort of ignore them. Now, her name in this, I think, is Margiana or Margiana. Margiana, but I don't oh, remember right. it. I don't know if it's used in the film or if it's just the cast list. Uh, looking at Sinbad's crew, I mean, the first person you sort of see on screen, I think, is Martin Shaw, Doyle, out yes. of the professionals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, who's playing a slightly comic role in this. Not a totally yeah. comic role, because no. obviously there is a, another bloke who's a, a fool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but he's sort of like the world weary. Bloke, you know, oh yeah, Sinbad's up to this again. Yeah. Yes. But he puts up with it all. He's the first mate, sort of. Yeah. person isn't he and the comic character although again he's only at the beginning he he, yeah, he, he, he does morphs come into through. a bit more of a serious yeah. is Haroon played by Kurt Christian who I don't know yeah those two characters uh, Martin Shaw is playing Rashid yes and the other bloke is Haroon 
and those two names, the the Sultan or the Caliph, rather, at the time of the Sinbad stories. In this, in is, fact, in re- this is in real life. Well, yeah, well it, the Sinbad stories begin in the time of the Caliph Harun al Rashid. Oh, okay. And so those two names, Harun and Rashid, oh. have been taken out of history because he was an actual Caliph. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And used. Uh, oh, that's uh, intended. Mm, I guess so. It yeah, must be. Yeah. I suppose. I mean, obviously, there. The handy Arabian sounding name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another main character is the Grand Vizier, and he's played by Douglas Wilmer. Mm-hmm. He spends most of the film locked inside a golden mask <laughs> yes. because he's had his face burned off, so he doesn't get the chance to do all his best acting expressions. No. Not until the end, anyway. Yeah, he played Sherlock Holmes in the 1960s for BBC. That's his oh, sort right. of, I think, his other main claim to fame. Uh, we've got a second Shaw, not related. So Martin Shaw played Rashid, and I didn't know this, but Robert Shaw, mm. who's a very famous actor, he was in Jaws, From Russia with Love, another Bond film, and A Man for All Seasons, and loads of other stuff. He played the Oracle, mm. but he's so heavily made up and you wouldn't recognise his voice. That I just wouldn't recognise him. <laughs> and I also convinced the Oracle had a Yorkshire accent when I heard it. it sounded a bit like Des Skin, the comics guy, if you, if you ever hear him speak. Well, any Yorkshireman, really. And also, doesn't he start the, his prediction by going, E by gum. <laughs> No, he doesn't. No, <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't. I don't remember that. Um, but anyway, he apparently Robert Shaw wanted to play Sinbad in this film. Yeah, and I don't know why he ended up not. Um, I mean, maybe they thought, well, we can't say no. He's really famous, but he's not. He's not quite right. <laughs> so we'll give him this minor role. But then no to s- him. disguise him, yeah, I mean, it's not like having like Laurence Olivier in time, the uh, hologram. Yeah, is <laughs> this person you just wouldn't recognise? <laughs> Anyway, so that's, that was interesting. I didn't know that, Robert Shaw. Yes. Let's quickly go through some of the others. It's directed by Gordon Hessler, who I... It's funny, isn't it? The director's quite often a big name mm. in the film, but here he's eclipsed, really, by the producers, which are Charles H. Schneer and Ray Harryhausen, who, of course, did all their mm. those classic Dynamation films together. You think of it as a Harryhausen it's film. It's a Harryhausen film. Well, it is. I mean, it was his concept. Mm. Uh, it's all it's all because of him, of course. Yeah. So He's like the auteur. <laughs> yes, the screenplay is by Brian Clemens, and he's quite interesting. He wrote a lot for TV, and he, and he sort of created, I think, or was one of the creators and produced and wrote for The Avengers. Ah, uh, right. And yeah. The New Avengers. Yeah. And, in fact, he, I think he was the writer for Captain Kronos. Yes. So he may have been the link to get Caroline Monroe in. Yeah, yeah. And he also wrote The Professionals, which, of course... Martin Short was in ah. and I guess that came after The Golden Voyage of Sinbad I think I mean that was something we used to watch wasn't it yeah as kids um, yes. So, and, and then the one last thing we, we've talked about music quite a lot with these films the music was by Miklos Rosa who did the original score for the 1940 Thief of Baghdad right so uh, Harry Housen was quite keen on him in fact he, I think he got an Oscar nomination for that and he won Oscars for Bellbound and Ben-Hur and a film called Double Life I think it was called Wow. Well, that's the Hitchcock. Um, yeah, Spellbound, spell yeah. And um, obviously not the silent Ben-Hur, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think all these adventure films are kind of blessed with really strong composers. We've had um, Max Steiner do mm. quite a number of them, or, and involved in another one. Um, in Maurice Jarre. Uh, Maurice Jarre and... John Williams, of course, in... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Star. yes. Um, so that's funny. Something that you tend to think of as maybe a sort of pulpy yeah. and not maybe taken seriously. And, and in some cases, children's. Mm. I think especially, I was going to say that about Gone Voyage of Sinbad, actually. It feels, it feels quite a lot like a children's film. Mm. And that's not diminishing it. Mm. It can be enjoyed by everyone. Mm. But unlike some of the others, say, I mean, Lawrence of Arabia... Yeah. And Man Who Would Be Man King, Man Who Would Be King would yeah. be the other main one. Which is quite gruesome and yeah. also psychologically gruesome, as yes. it were. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't necessarily say they're children's films. Yeah. Although a lot of people think of adventure and that kind of thing as a children's, you know, yeah. in the domain of children's yes. entertainment. Yeah. Um, which is ridiculous, of course. But anyway, whereas this one does seem more like a, yeah. a film that might... I mean, it's not got the sophistication of some of the others. Yeah, yeah. But consistently, they've had fantastic music, and that's the case again with Golden Voyage of Sinbad, I think. Mm. What secret? What is to be revealed? Power. Absolute power. Power to rid this land forever of Kura's black and ugly ambitions. If this power were to fall into Kura's hands, that thought constantly torments me. For if Kura were to obtain absolute power in this land, freedom and happiness would be lost to Moravia forever. Absolute power. I pray to Allah, but he does not hear me. 
So, uh, do you want to give a quick overview of the what the Royal Simpsons is about? What's Golden Royal Simpsons yeah. about? <laughs> Well, actually, I'll start with the thing that I thought it immediately opens with Sinbad and his crew are in the middle of the ocean and they, <laughs> they sight something flying over them, which turns out to be this little bat-winged homunculus. Oh, yes, yes. But they can't see it at first, and one of them thinks it might be an albatross. Even. Yeah. And someone says, let's shoot it. You know, my immediate thought on that was that it's um, like the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Right. Which is Coleridge's poem where the ancient mariner shoots an albatross and brings bad luck. At the beginning of this, they say... Oh, yes, yeah. Some says, oh, shoot it. And some says, no, it'll, you'll bring bad luck. Yeah. But Sinbad is, is the one who shoots it. And he doesn't care about good luck or no, bad Sinbad luck. No, doesn't shoot it, does he? Doesn't he? No, I think it's one of the crew. Oh, right. And then he comes out and he picks up the gold tablet, the, yeah. whatever it is. So this thing was carrying yes. a gold tablet yeah. intent for Prince Kura. Yeah. Because it's his magical creation. He yes. controls it. Yeah. And so this is the start of the adventure they've got this mysterious yeah. gold gold again that yes. always comes up in adventures yes. but they've got this gold artifact and as soon as Sandman picks it up mm. um, he has a vision he sees a dancing woman with a tattoo this is in his dream yeah at night yeah I think isn't it as soon as he picks it up because oh, then I don't he, remember because then he realises he sees all this yeah and then he realises the crew are saying what's the matter oh, right. so I think yes, it is yes. daylight yeah 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 he sees a dancing slave girl with a, an eye tattooed in her palm. Yeah, we don't see her face. Yeah, And he sees the sort of dark silhouette of mm, Prince Kuro, mm. which I thought was very Dracula-like, because he sort of lifts his coat. Oh, yeah, yeah. And in fact, later on, they that's say... Another, that's the other Hammer film I think Carol Munro's wrote. Uh, in. Dracula AD 1972, uh, I right. think. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. <laughs> later on, um, Sinbad, or, or it might be the vizier, describes uh, Prince Kuro as a great black bat of a man oh, right so it's almost yeah. like they've got a dracula connection yeah there. yeah that's true that yeah. is true yeah and rashid says tells him not to pick yes. the thing up because it's yeah. going to bring bad luck and the, the interesting thing that maybe again makes this different from some of the other adventure films is certainly at this point they're accidentally brought into the adventure mm. um yeah, it's a bit like tintin who's a lot of his adventures start by walking along and finding something on a park bench and he gets dragged into whatever right yeah i mean and then of course he pursues it because yeah. that's his nature. Mm. Um, he's curious and then wants to find out. And it's the same with this. They get accidentally drawn into it. Although, with the whole Middle East gods and things, you could say it's fate. Yeah. And they follow their fate. But then when he finds out more about the tablets, like Tintin, yeah. <laughs> he wants to pursue it. Because yeah, he's, he's up, an adventurer. He's up for the adventure. Of yes, course, yeah. 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 At which point he also thinks, oh, there might be some riches in here for me. Yes, yeah, that's the gold thing again, isn't it? Well, there's... This is made of gold, but it leads to greater riches. Yes, yeah. Anyway, we're, we're getting... Well, what happens next? In fact, I always thought, all right, then there's a storm, and they're, yeah. they're lost at sea, and then they end up... But, of course, the storm, I bet that's caused by Prince Kura trying to bring uh, the yeah. amulet towards that him. seems obvious now you yeah. say that, and I never actually <laughs> thought of that. Because you don't connect it with him at the time. No. But, anyway, there's a storm, they're lost Good at point. sea, they yes. come to land. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, Sinbad thinks he can see someone on the, the shore, yeah. jumps overboard, and this is where he meets Prince Kura. Which and is that's quite... a great little moment where Rashid is on the is on the side of the ship as he yeah. jumps in. He doesn't go, stop, or you're mad, or anything. He just, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's Sinbad. <laughs> yeah, Sinbad's off again. Yeah. In fact, it's quite an early point, you know, that you bring the goody and the baddie together right in yeah. the beginning. That, doesn't often happen. Yeah, I mean, this is a very quite a straightforward adventure, but it certainly mm. moves along, and you do get that. I mean, he so he comes up on the beach. It's very good, actually. It's just yeah. they're not they're completely unapologetic about. We need to, <laughs> we need um. I was going to say Tintin then, Sinbad <laughs> to um you know, Sin Sin. Um, we need Sinbad to meet Kura straight away and for them to have some. Yeah. Power. So oh, how can we do it? Oh, just he jumps in and yeah. swims, and they do have this um, this little... Short altercation, Sinbad yeah. uh, jumps on a horse and gallops away. Chased enters, by Kura. Enters a city, and Kura doesn't follow him into the city. Yeah, and this is Morabia. Right. Which I can't find... <laughs> I mean, at first I thought Arabia. Do you mean Arabia? But it's the city of Morabia. And I can't find much information about that. So I'm presuming it's just made up for the yeah, film. Yeah, a fantastic place. Yeah. Um, Which but... they've cleverly come up with by adding the letter M to Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> Morabia. Just a fool. Is that just left from Garabia? <laughs> no, that's Darabia. Think. Anyway. So Sinbad pretty quickly meets the vizier of Morabia. Yes. Who is this man with the golden mask? Yes. And the vizier, well, he sees that Sinbad has got this golden tablet and says, ah, I've got another one of those. Yeah. And explains to him basically what the adventure's about. He takes him to this room <laughs> that is sort of the secret, the secret room, really, that's all burnt out. 
because yeah. when the caliph died, the grand vizier has been made sort of caliph in waiting, I think. Yeah. And for him to take up his fate properly, he's got to, I think I remember this correctly, solve this yeah. puzzle. There's this map he needs. And um, Kura set fire to the room, and that's when he got his face burnt off and why he wears this mask. Yeah. Basically, there's a map on the wall, but it's it's very rough. Yeah. It's, uh, and around it, there are symbols. Says, the thing about the map, I think, it's just land masses. Yes. There's no, there's no indication of where it is. Yeah. Uh, and there are foreboding symbols around it, which um, they say, that can only mean dangers of death, or, and Sinbad says... Yeah. Or great riches, perhaps. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, But then Sinbad discovers that the... I really like this moment. Sin, they, there's a flame set up just to give light. Mm. And Sinbad happens to be holding the tablets at the right distance from... And you notice that their shadow falls perfectly on the circular map. Yeah. Fills in all the details so they know where they have to go. Yes. Yeah, it's great. One of those reveals that yeah. suddenly... And yeah, so that's got the... the it's a nautical chart suddenly, I guess, yeah. with longitude and latitude. But they're being watched by the homunculus yeah. of Kura. So he's also... Kura can see through its eyes. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so he can hear. And, and there's a wonderful moment when they, they notice the homunculus... And they're trying to get it. It gets behind some yes, furniture. Yes, yeah. And if, you, if anyone's ever sort of <laughs> had a cat bring a mouse into their house or a bird or yeah. or even a big spider that you're trying to... And it goes behind your I mean, bit of furniture and you're trying to get... It's, they really captured that yeah. feeling, didn't they? Trying to sort of prod it out from behind. Harryhausen quite often... He doesn't just have fights. You no. know, he does like to have... Because obviously the homunculus is a Harryhausen creature. Yeah. But, you know, he likes to have interesting interactions between oh, yeah, people. So it's a sort of a fight, but really it's not a fight. You know, yeah, it's not yeah. like a standard fight. No. So it's just a, a variation, you know. Uh, there's a lot of character in his mm. um, animated characters. I'm going to skip ahead a bit, but just related, though. Yeah. There's another bit with the homunculus where Tom Baker creates a new homunculus yeah. aboard a ship. And he's got the, I think they're originally from Mandrake Root. Yeah, Mandrake Root and a few chemicals, he says. Yeah, and, yeah. and he uses his blood. But although he seems to be bringing the body of a homunculus that he's perhaps made up. Yeah. Um, and he adds his blood to it. And as it wakes, it does this screams. Yeah. These all, all sort of like these waking screams. I mean, they're not blood curdling screams. They're from a, a small... And yeah. that just says so much about it, I think. Yeah. Almost as if coming into life is a kind yeah. of agony. Yeah. And then it's very wary of Tom Baker and he prods it and there's mm. a bit of a yeah, there's a real interaction between them. He's sort of playing with it, you know, he's sparring it with with a pair of tongs or whatever. Yeah. And you forget that this is a, a clay or whatever yeah. model. Because you, because of the character in it, you're immediately mm. drawn into the scene as a real thing. And he puts his arm out and the monk just leaps onto it. Yeah. Uh, jumps onto it, hops onto it. And you don't think of it, oh, it's just a monster. No. It's a creature. Because uh, it's not evil. It's, you know, you, you know that it's... And you do have some sympathy for these... Yeah. yeah right <laughs> from the beginning. At, well, maybe not the flying bit, but certainly... When yeah. it's watching and they're trying to prod yeah. it and it's trying to stay alive, just like a, a mouse would, for instance. Yes. Uh, brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. So anyway, back to the story. We've got our adventure now because they agree to go and yeah. find a third piece to complete. And of course, the, the thing they're going for... Is, it's a semi It completes a semicircle rather than a circle, doesn't it? Yeah, well, the two pieces they've got to do, but the whole, all three together, I think, make a circle. Oh, the other one's... The last yeah. one's a big... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but why? Why they're going for it? The vizier says the prize they're after is power, absolute power. Yeah. And he's after it to rid the land of Kura. Yeah. But if Kura gets it, obviously Kura will have that much more power, and he will basically rule. Which is also and, what he wants, of course. Yeah. So it's a race as well as uh, a quest. Yeah. You're thinking the same as I, Rashid. I will. Captain, an island, if it exists here. And it can only be one place, Lemuria. Lemuria? Aye, the mythical island. Mariners have been searching for it for centuries. They say it is all that is left of a once mighty continent now sunk beneath the waves. They say it is a place of untold dangers, of death. They say it is a place... The man who fears the unknown will one day take fright of his own backside. Well, there you have it. We seek Lemuria. We wager our skill against death. And for rich reward. Find this island, and a handsome prize awaits every man. Are you with me? Aye, aye. To Lemuria. And about it to boot. Now, Sinbad goes into Morabia, and he's followed by this merchant 
and his uh, servant. Yeah. And but it ends up being the merchant wants Sinbad to take his unruly son, his yeah. hashish smoking <laughs> wastrel of a son, yeah. as a crew member to make a man of him, which yeah. he declines because he doesn't want this dead weight with him. Yeah, yeah. Until he sees the slave girl come in with a drink, yeah. Caroline Monroe, and sees that she's got an eye tattooed on her hand, which on the palm of her hand. What he had a vision of. He's yeah. had a vision. So he agrees to take the boy as long as he can take the girl as well. Mm. Uh, he actually frees her. Yes. Although not until she's on board the ship <laughs> and yeah. can't go anywhere. <laughs> You're free now. Oh, thanks. Great. <laughs> so I swim to shore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I like about this film is that they've all, all the characters have got accents. Yes. They've got Middle Eastern accents. Yeah. And it's not sort of hokey or bad. Yeah. And it actually gives it quite an exotic flavour, I think. Yeah. And everyone does it. You don't have American accents or even English accents, yeah, uh, British accents, whatever, and it just adds to the kind of. Uh, I think I think it gives the right atmosphere, the exotic flavour. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Another thing, not just the accents, but also the way they speak. There's quite a lot of uh, they put they sprinkle the dialogue with these little sort of mock Oriental sayings. Okay. Like, I mean, the main one is "trust in Allah, but tie up your camel," camel yeah. which uh, comes up a few times. Yeah. Uh, but there's also um, things like uh, he who searches for pearls should not sleep and he who's afraid of the unknown will one day take fright at his own backside. <laughs> <laughs> that, I've, I've heard that uh, take fright of your own shadow. Yeah. Maybe, but uh, backside's an <laughs> interesting um, slant on it. Yeah, it's a funny <laughs> twist. So uh, the next day they set off on their voyage. Yeah, now we know they're looking for this island and I think when Rashid and Sinbad look at it they recognise it as Lemuria which is... A bit like Atlantis. Lemuria was, is, was a mythical land in the Pacific, mm. I think, or Indian Ocean that is supposed to have sunk mm. and disappeared. Yeah. And it's interesting, unlike Atlantis, which is, of course, from Plato and stuff, uh, Lemuria came about from a biologist, I think, who was studying <laughs> the fauna of Madagascar. And as you might know, Madagascar's got quite a lot of creatures that are unique Mm. to it as an island and he wondered why this was you know where did they come from why are there similar animals in madagascar and india with connections but not in africa right. which madagascar is closer to yeah and he posited that there must have been or could have been at one point a landmass right that um has since disappeared and he called it lemuria based on the sort of lemurs yes. from madagascar <laughs> which are, are unique to madagascar as sort of very early, well, a, a primate species, I think, yeah. that apes and monkeys have come from, but they're still quite sort of from its early stage. So that's why, <laughs> that's Lemuria, and I, th I think Lima itself comes from a Roman ghost. Yeah. Because of their big eyes and the noise yeah. they make and the fact they're nocturnal. So um, yeah. that's Lemuria. Um, wow. There was also there was Atlantis, Lemuria, and Mu was another one. Yeah, these yeah. things. But of course, now with plate tectonics and you know the geological uh, plates, we know that. That's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, um, but, but anyway. the, the, the legend remains. You know? Yeah, I mean, so it had this sort of scientific origin, if you like. I mean, it, not mm. scientific. It was, it was he, he sort of conjured it up as a possibility. But it was taken on by people like Madame Blatsky. Yeah. And, and <laughs> um, you know, and entered the sort of alternative mm, um, yeah. occult <laughs> circles and, and has become yeah some people believe that Lemuria mm. existed because of that mm. you know, people are into these alternative theories theories it of becomes the another world. another card in that exactly. big deck of yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean it's interesting mm. it's interesting and of course the thing that connects that to a lot of other adventure films that we've covered is immediately where they're going has got this aura of yeah, myth and yeah. you know like they say oh there's going to be they immediately know that it's a place where there's going to be dangers and great rewards mm. and in fact Sinbad says to the crew right we're off to Lemuria uh, there'll be many dangers but there'll be great rewards yes. you know, and they'll cheer a bit <laughs> and again it's off the map kind of stuff yes, yeah. I mean obviously they've got a map for it but it's <laughs> like um, the man who would be king where they go to Kafiristan yeah. which is basically an unexplored country from the point of view of the colonial point of view yeah and i mean i suppose you could say time bandits again they've got a map yes. but it's <laughs> it's to places that you can't you wouldn't normally go yeah um and of course the main one is king kong where they've got the map to skull king island kong, yeah. and even she as well so it's yeah. lost these lost places yeah that you go to and that's the excitement yeah of course so even in this being a fantasy and mythical setting where you a lot of it is made up yeah there's still that excitement of a lost 
yes. land that they discover how to get to, yeah. and off they go. So. It's almost like another degree of fantasy. You know, yeah. you've got the sort of yes. the civilized fantasy world, but now we've got the real pure well, stuff. At the beginning of the film, the parameters are set of what what reality is, what mm. you're going from, and then what's extraordinary. And I think that's that's one thing that makes these all adventure films yeah. is the ordinary. Yeah. discovering the extraordinary yes. and the people who are willing to go and do that mm. and will they you know it's the battle to do to do that and hopefully yeah. get some reward and again there's the other things they fight of course as well as the physical geographical is there's the um if you like mental psychological aspects mm. which quite often comes about because of greed yes or well it nearly always comes out because of greed <laughs> whether that's because you want to live forever and you want that power yeah or you want the treasure Whatever it is, and it's that's pretty similar within all these films to some degree. Yes, yeah. So here we are again with this kind of thing. I mean, it's the basic story, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the conflict. You've got to go somewhere. That's the whole point of a story. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. And then you just got to paint in the details of mm. why and what and all that and who, of course. Master, you are ill. You saw everything. I came when I heard your cry. Then you know. Enough, Master. Yes. Yes. You will die if you go on this way. To summon the demons of darkness, there is a price. And each time I call upon them, it consumes part of me. Come, Ahmed. We have no time to lose. So they set off on a voyage and almost immediately they, uh, Sinbad and co realise they're being followed by a ship that is faster mm. than them. Yes. Which they realise, of course, is Prince Kura. Yeah. And uh, it gets to night time and it's quite foggy and Sinbad takes them through an area which is quite rocky and right. shallow. Yeah. Uh, which he says he can get them through because he's been through once. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Which is the typical Sinbad uh, yeah. You know, yeah. carelessness. Um, and of course... Um, Kura's captain won't go through it at night and in fog so Kura has to get uh, Sinbad and of course they're just following the ship yeah. they don't know where they're going No, no. they're just following Sinbad and so the captain of Kura's ship won't go through unless he's got a chart yeah. So Kura has to get a chart of Sinbad's yes, ship, which right. is yeah. how we get to the first major Harryhausen monster. <laughs> yeah. yes, <laughs> yes, which is the figurehead that comes alive, yeah. the wooden figurehead. Yeah, which was a bit of a a leap of reality because Middle East ships didn't really have a figurehead. That was a more of a Western mm. thing. So it was there purely so they could have this yeah. creature. Although it's absolutely fine. Of course, there's also a figurehead in uh, Jason and the Argonauts, isn't there? Ah, that's right. Is it the is the goddess? Yeah, uh, she. That's how she just uh, speaks to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, that's true. Now. How does he make the figurehead come alive? Is it just... It's purely remote, isn't it? It doesn't send yeah. anything Yeah, it's it. magic. I and mean, one of the things that, about magic in this, whenever Kura uses magic, he ages. Yeah. So he pays a price for yeah, it. In yeah, fact, yeah. he says, to summon the demons <laughs> of darkness, there is a price. Yes. Every time it's it brilliant. consumes a part of me. Yeah. Which is one of the things which I've seen written elsewhere saying makes this stand out as a film. You know, most genre films, if you've got a baddie who's a sorcerer, he just uses magic, flings it about, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. But here, there's a very definite price to it. There's a definite limit to the amount of magic he can use as well, because mm. it take it ages him. Yes, as we find out as we get towards the end of the film. That does make him a more interesting character yeah. immediately, doesn't it? Yeah. Because, uh, as you say, he's not just got uh, carte blanche to cast a spell and yeah. and be all powerful. Yeah. So he's in his own race. I mean, his mm. magic obviously limited. Yeah. Um, and in yeah. fact, you were saying earlier, you, you get to like Harryhausen's monsters, his mm. creatures. Mm. And in fact, Kura is one of them, really, because yes. you sort of see him in human terms rather than just as a monster like he's got yeah, a servant yeah. called Ahmed yes who is concerned for Kura's yes, well-being yes. Says, I, now I didn't I didn't look up who uh, Ahmed was played by and he's yeah. actually another major character yeah but you're right he's quite concerned for him and Kura is almost a bit like an addict yes uh, <laughs> he's got to you know he knows it's bad for him yeah <laughs> and and um his servant keeps telling him not to but it's the power. He he wants the prize. Mm. And so he'll do whatever it takes. Yeah. And of course, by the end of this, because one of the things that he's going to get by you know taking the tablets to the Fountain of Destiny, which is where we eventually get to, 
is youth, which is going to cancel out all of this magic that he spent. Right, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. But he's basically committed to this point. Yes, he's counting on that, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, there's this great moment where the figurehead of the ship yes. comes, like creaks, because it's made of yeah. wood, and you really hear the sound effects on this are yeah. fantastic. And so the, the first thing it does, it tears itself off from the rest of the wood. Yeah. You really hear that splintering. And of course, Haroon is up there at the front. and <laughs> Drinking. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those classic looks at the bottle <laughs> yeah, moments. Yeah, the double take, yeah. <laughs> and anyway, so it comes to life and it smashes the door down and grabs the chart and the sailors are fighting it. And, yeah. Uh, I think Sinbad eventually... The they brain, start using fire. Yeah, he, he gets to use fire, which obviously, because the, there's harpoons and spears do nothing against mm, wood. Yeah. Um, and they drive it into the sea. It falls over, unfortunately, with the chart. Although Sinbad says, I've got it all up here. Yeah. He's got it in his head, so they're okay. But of course, the bad thing now is that Kura he also has fetches it. the chart up from yeah. the bottom of the sea. Yeah. But anyway, a fantastic Harryhausen mm. moment. Yeah. Um, these things come to life. It's really amazing. So anyway, let's let's speed along. They get to the Lemuria. They get to yes. Lemuria. Yeah. Um, and they go ashore, and you see these huge cliffs, and um, carved into the cliffs are... They're quite Indian. Mm. And in fact, Harryhausen originally wanted to film it in India. Oh, right. But they, they've ended up filming it in Spain and Mallorca. And I, I think this beach was actually quite... Although it's kind of remote, it was used. And that cliff you see yeah. isn't actually there. It's a map painting. <laughs> and it's hiding um, people watching. Because <laughs> hey. I, when I saw that... It really reminded me of other... I think it might reminded me of the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, where there's a similar valley between yeah. high cliffs. I think, and also in um, uh, The Eye of the Tiger is a similar yeah. setting as well. Yeah. And I, it may even be the same beach. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I think that was also filmed in Mallorca or Spain or something. Also, it's got the feeling of King Kong's Skull Island, where there is this huge yeah. uh, escarpment all the way around it. And then there's the gates that you get through to get to Kong's bit. But yeah. here there's just a, 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 a a natural valley between the yeah, cliffs but yeah. still feels as though there's a wall and there's a doorway and you go through that well it's that <laughs> lovely feeling of awe because it's so big yes. you've got the huge cliffs and the huge statues or yeah. uh, carvings and that, there's that feeling of awe and the unknown and ancient civilization. Yeah, it just sets the mood really that's, that's what they are, that's what they do they set the mood, they're very important yes. for storytelling that kind of ingredient yeah and as you say the island it is it is there are similarities to king kong the island setting and the quest yeah know, so um anyway the first thing they do is go and find this oracle yeah robert shaw from <laughs> from uh yorkshire <laughs> the yorkshire oracle uh, <laughs> which they find in this sort of temple like building yeah. down into the caves underneath it yeah and he gives them um he speaks in verse v- which yes, oracles do and he tells yeah. them go north go north go north or whatever he's north north <laughs> he just repeats yes. it endlessly yeah. <laughs> and also he says um at the at the end it, he sets it up as being a battle between good and evil, but mm. he says that at the end, it's the deeds of weak and mortal men that may tip the scales one way or another. Right, yeah. Which is something that I quite like about this film, is um, like that saying, you know, uh, trust in Allah, but tie up your camel. Yeah. <laughs> it's got this balance between they're doing things which are the sort of deeds of myth and legend, Yeah. and you feel as though the gods are involved and magic, but also it's the feeling yeah. that mortal men can take destiny into their own hands. Which is very much a part of these adventure films. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's people deciding to go, right, me and uh, Thingy are going to go to <laughs> Kafiristan. You yes, know? yes. And it's, you know, it's the feeling that individuals matter. Even yeah. in these huge events like wars, you know, like Lawrence of Arabia. It was a, a war involving yeah. nations. Yes. One man made a difference. Yes, you know, yes. That's... It's almost, it's going against fate yeah. if you dare and you may win or you may lose yeah. I mean that's something that's quite uh, sort of Greek myths as well the, yes. the gods are playing with you know man is their plaything. Yeah, but someone who's sort of brave and strong enough can actually go against that some degree and make a yeah. A change, yeah. So yeah. there is that aspect to it. Um, so anyway, Cora uh, uses his explosive chemicals and yeah. and traps them in after they've seen the oracle, the oracle so they can't yeah. get out. Yeah. And uh, but they do, of course. Yeah. Uh, rather ingeniously with a, a bow and a the leg of a brazier thing. Yeah. And uh, out they get. They climb out the top. And there's the moment where um, Sinbad is the first one to climb up the rope. And as he's near the top, the the homunculus attacks. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, it's Haroon 
takes the bow and shoots. <laughs> yes. And uh, Haroon, at this point, hasn't really proved himself no. as anything but... Uh, He's handed a bow, I think. Yeah. He's like, give it to me, I'll do yeah. it. And they're like, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> so if he was known as an excellent archer, <laughs> then, you know... Sinbad wouldn't mind, but <laughs> <laughs> that's true. He's, think, he's aiming. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, he luckily he does it. Yeah, he Breaks kills the kills the uh, homunculus, that's doesn't right, he? Yeah. And uh, of course, <laughs> Kura feels the pain of its death. So off they go north. <laughs> yes. And is it the next bit we get to the green natives? Yeah. Yeah. Now oh, wait a minute. Now Kura's gone ahead, of course. Yes. So he gets there first. Yes. Yeah. And he and his servant Ahmed Ahmed <laughs> are captured by these green natives. Yeah. I'm not sure if they're green because that's their race yeah. <laughs> they're green or if it's some kind of body paint yeah. uh, type of scary thing which it yes. may, may yeah, be yeah it could be I think it could be yeah assume it's that. <laughs> so they get taken in and it looks like they're about to be sacrificed or something or killed and eaten who knows maybe, yeah. maybe even hot potted <laughs> um <laughs> But Kura, um, he's standing there with this brilliant Tom Baker look. All, they're all <laughs> dancing madly around him. It doesn't yeah. seem to phase him at all. He throws this concoction at... They've got a statue of Carly. Yeah. He throws this concoction at it. It bursts across it. Yeah. And Carly comes to life. Yes. In what is the high point, <laughs> the sort of set piece <laughs> yeah. of the film. This is the one... If you know this film at all, this is the one bit you remember, which is yeah. the six-armed... And it is a Carly classic moment to life. Yeah. in film history. Yeah. It really is. It's so well done. I mean, like, people, when they talk of Harryhausen, they usually say the fight with the skeletons in yeah. the Argonauts is... Yeah. But this is my favourite Harryhausen There was, moment. of course, a, a fight with skeletons in the first Sinbad film as well. Yeah, there's or one a skeleton. skeleton. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. But anyway, this is... So, it's six-armed Carly, and at first he makes it dance. Yes. And so he proves that he's got power over the god, or at least mm. is its equal, and Ahmed and the others... Yeah. And the green men, off they go, because so, yeah. he wants to converse with the god in private. Although, actually, what he does is then ransack the place looking for the final piece yeah, yeah. of um, the, the, yeah, the, the tablets. Tablet. Now, the dance that Carly does, I've, heard, I've read that it's, it copies movements from The Thief of Baghdad. The, oh, there's right, a, right. A so another... Arm, another um, yeah, there's a six-armed automaton, which, is, uh, which looks like... Carly, I think it's a silver, a silver woman yeah. with six arms who does a dance for as she's presented as a gift to Cali. Right, right. I haven't actually seen it, so I can't say if it's the same. But but it's a tribute, yeah, to yeah. one of his, what we know is one of his favourite films yeah. and and an inspiration to this. Yeah, um, um, again with the wood on the ship's uh, head. Yeah, the uh, yeah figurehead. Figurehead. Yeah. With this, there's again the noise, and I think it's metal. Yeah, I think it's a bronze statue. There's I the creaking. Stone, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I, obviously, the reason one of the reasons I like it is because of the creaking of the metal. Yeah. So maybe you listen to that again and see what you think. But don't forget that it shatters when. Uh... I still think it could be a bronze statue. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we'll see. But I, I, anyway, whatever. The noise as it creaks. Yeah. Is, as it moves. is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, the metallic, just just makes you the metallic, believe it. Listeners, it's metallic noise. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it was stone, sorry, yeah. if it was stone, surely it would be sort of a, a grinding sound it would make rather than this. Is, yeah. Isn't it a slight squeaky? You know, I don't remember the sound. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it at that. Yes, um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. It's, it's such a fantastic... And, and then, so the dance is great. Yeah. And as if that wasn't good enough, when Sinbad arrives and confronts Kura, yeah. he throws a sword to Kali, yeah. who's the Hindu goddess of death and mm. the destroyer yeah again indian mm. and of course if lemuria was in between in if it would be in the indian ocean i guess oh, so yeah, right, yeah. i mean i mean i think the idea is perhaps that the civilization of lemuria actually was what informed uh india and hinduism oh, right. yeah, so, it, yeah, yeah so yeah so anyway uh, yeah kura throws the sword to kali and brilliantly yes <laughs> it sprouts six swords one for each hand yeah yeah you think he throws the sword you think right come on then but no, straight away, ching, 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 yeah. ching. Just, I mean, that, if, if we're thinking of this as a classic moment of the film, <laughs> it's a brilliant scene, this is the classic moment of the classic moment yes, yeah. <laughs> with the swords. I mean, that really, I, I just, watching it again, I'm used to it now, I know what's going to happen. Mm. But I still remember seeing it for the, well, I presume it was the first time. Yeah. And that being another awe-inspiring moment yeah. where you think, how can they defeat this thing? Yeah. And it's the same with all these. This is not a living creature. This is something that's been animated. Well, this is a god. Well, Kura says it's a god. Yeah. But I think he's actually, like he did the ship's bow, he's animated it yes. to scare the natives. Yeah, yeah. But it's not a living thing. And that makes yeah. it even more scary. Because how do you kill something that isn't alive? Yeah. How do you, how do you harm something that's made of 
metal or stone. <laughs> um, you know, it's... And it's got the, the face, which is implacable. Yes. You can't even reason with it. You no. can't... It won't show any pain. Exactly. Yeah. And it's got six swords. <laughs> and so it's just it's just an incredible yeah. moment. So and, and the fight is so well done. I, mm. I don't even... You know, it's an old technology dynamation now. We've got CGI to replace it, but it's brilliant. And how he did it, I don't even know. Yeah. It just must have taken so much work. I mean, think about it. A six-armed creature fighting swords. You've never seen that on screen before. You probably would never see no, it again. No. And But it's co- totally convincing the way it fights with six it's arms. It's so well worked out. Yeah. I think it took about a month to do. Um, and I think it may have been a year before they had really? the finished thing. I'll have to double-check that. But I think while rehearsing, certainly, he, he had two stuntmen sort of tied together. Sword oh. fighters, and even that was only four arms. Yeah, um, they sort of, you know, made up the, the other two or something. Wow. Anyway, so a great fight sequence, and um, it ends up being Haroon again. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Who um, saves the day by he leaps at the back of Carly. That's right. While it's dealing with Sinbad, yeah, and it, it falls, falls off, falls and smashes, smashes, and then we see the third uh, golden tablet. Uh, of in course, there. it's hidden in Carly inside yeah. Carly. Which is great. It's great how one thing leads to another. Yeah. It moves the film forward very naturally yes. um, without stops. So mm. the fight leads to obviously an exciting fight and that actually leads to them mm. finding the final piece mm. of the tablet. But anyway, and then all the green natives yeah. <laughs> come back in. Come in. I suppose the good thing about green natives is, is no one's offended. <laughs> Co- colonial. They're not harking to any colonial <laughs> thing. Because we've had... Quite a few, yeah, you know, where no white man has ever been. Yes, yeah. Obviously, uh, this is the home of the green men. Yeah. Uh, oh, can't get offended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but of course, immediately, uh, Kura now has all three pieces, all yes. three golden tablets. Yes. And this is where he actually tells us what, so far we've only known that they all give him power. Yeah. But here he actually says that what they'll give him is... Youth, a shield of darkness, and a crown of untold riches. Right, yeah. And so he leaves them to be killed by the natives. Yes. And he goes off to the Fountain of Destiny to yeah. get these three rewards. Indeed, yeah. But just just as they're about to be killed, I guess just normally killed, you know, slaughtered. <laughs> um, well, isn't how- Sinbad put on a rack or something? Or I can't remember. He's uh, suddenly tied up. He's put down something and tied up. Yeah. Anyway, I try to make but then a wreck. Caroline Monroe says stop and they see the oh, yes, the yeah. eye tattooed on her hand and yeah. this is a symbol to them because Carly had uh, eyes on her hands. I didn't notice that. I, I only noticed it this time actually. Right. <laughs> Cuz of oh. course pretty much she's got the swords in her hands after that but I think she does have yeah. eyes in her hands. So it's the symbol of their god and it turns out to mean that she's like the perfect sacrifice to the one-eyed yeah. god. Oh, of course, uh, the yeah, Cyclops is the one Cyclops, eye. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I do think it's a little bit. There's not really fully explained. Yes. I think that is a slight <laughs> weakness that it's a bit of a. It could be a coincidence that she's got an eye, and, yeah. and and that means something to them. And we don't really know what it means. But as you say, it's on. It's almost. It does feel a bit like an afterthought. The Carly yeah. thing, maybe. Oh, let's put some eyes on something. Saying, but actually. The Cyclops, that does make more sense if it's the sign yeah. of the Cyclops. Yeah. But why is you know, why is she a sacrifice and not a queen? Yeah. You know, <laughs> our queen has come back to us. Yeah. She's in command of everything. Anyway, obviously, it's within its own um, rules and regulations. Yeah. And... I suppose the point, it, it works because it doesn't really matter that much. They were going to be killed, but this is just a, another bad thing on top of that. She yeah. gets thrown to the god rather yeah, than just being slaughtered. And, yeah. and actually, we've seen things before where... Um, at the last minute, something's revealed, and, yes. and oh, you're, you're actually our savior, and we're not going to kill you. Yeah, like and the, actually, the, this makes it worse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's going to get. I've, oh, I've saved him. Oh, they're going to kill me. <laughs> yes, yeah. She gets thrown into a pit, or lowered yeah. into a pit, not yep. thrown, yep. and tied there. And then they do they blow a horn or something. Uh, yes, and bang a gong, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and summon the uh, the Cyclops Centaur. Yes. Which, you know, has quite a quite an entrance, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. It is, well, you see its shadow first, yes, of course. Yeah. And the clippity crop. Yeah. You think, what's you coming? You hear it coming, then you see its shadow, and then it steps into the light. And I think he'd already used the Cyclops in Sim- the first Sinbad film. Yes, yeah. And he, so he knew that. So to make it different, he made it a centaur. So the Cyclops with the body of a horse. Mm. But even in the first one, he wanted this Cyclops. But he didn't want it just to look like a normal person coming out of a cave. Mm. Because he wanted to show off that he was... He wanted people to think, oh, that's just a person in a suit. Right. So he, yeah. the Cyclops in the first one has got 
um, goat legs like yes. like a devil. Yeah. So that you would know that it was. Yeah. You know, it makes it that little bit more magical. Yeah. So and this one's a centaur, of course. Yeah. And he takes off Caroline Monroe. Yes, in a King Kong type <laughs> of thing again. <laughs> yes, yeah. Whereas Kong. So, you know, Fay Ray is is tied up and taken yeah. by Kong here. Carol Monroe is tied up and taken by the centaur. Uh, and then Sinbad and Co break free. Yeah. And at this point, we cross to Kura, who has dismissed his servant and is going on on his own towards the Fountain of Destiny. Yeah, yeah. And this is one of the things I like about Kura in this film that he's not just a supervillain who does everything gets everything right as he's approaching the fountain of destiny he drops his box of alchemical tricks oh that's right yeah rolls yeah. down the hill and yeah. explodes yeah. which he was going to use to open the doors to the fountain of destiny yeah so now he's forced to use magic which Some... ages him that little bit more yeah so when he get come he now really needs that youth <laughs> yes yeah you know, he's basically on his last leg that's right yeah um his um Ahmed has disappeared. Yeah. He's I gone on alone, and that's not really explained, is it? No, I, I can't remember if he sends him off. You never know if it's something that was filmed and then cut out. Yeah, that's like, true. Apparently there was a scene, I don't know if it was filmed and cut out or just planned and never filmed, but there was a Valley of the Vipers was supposed to be part of this film. Yes, yeah. Um, with sort of well, vipers, obviously. I think some big snake beast as well. Oh, you're right. That may have just been concept and... And, yeah, and yeah, it was the budget <laughs> uh, meant that it didn't get filmed or, or put in. Yeah, yeah, and Kura makes it to the fountain, and there's this agonising bit. He's trying <laughs> to just tip the thing, which goes off quite seems for ages. Yeah. Can't get it in, get it in. Trying to get the, this one tablet in so he gets youth <laughs> yes. just before he dies. Yeah. yeah. But meanwhile, Sinbad and Co have gone after Marianne, Marianne, whatever her name is. Yes. Um, Caroline Monroe. Right to res- Yeah, to try and rescue her. And yeah. They find her in a pit, surrounded by bones and things. Don't yes. They? But and she says, "Oh, you didn't go after Kura." Hmm. And this is one of those things that ties up with the other adventure films, where at, at some point you've got to learn the lesson about what is truly valuable. Yeah. Do you give up on your friends mm. and take the gold? Yes. Or, or take the kingship? Or because whatever. they obviously know Kura's gone. Yeah. But he chooses to rescue. Yeah. Sinbad goes after the girl yeah. instead of uh, yeah. the gold. Or yes. Kura. Proving his moral structure. Yes. <laughs> Proving that he's a, a complete human being rather than a yeah. uh, you know yes. a, a monster. Indeed. Uh, but then they go and find Kura. <laughs> yes, who's already there. Now he's he turns around and he's young again. Yes. Because he's got the youth, and that's this has got um, a connection perhaps with she the last film we looked at yeah with the yeah. flame yeah. of eternal life yeah this isn't necessarily eternal life well i don't know maybe it yeah, is. they just say youth yeah. but it's certainly a similar sort of thing a similar sort of concept where it's not and this has got everything it's got treasure fighting prowess and um eternal youth whereas she was just the flame of eternal youth really yeah but it's you know similar and it's surrounded by a sort of stonehenge type structure yes, as well yeah. it's got everything yeah. hindu and um <laughs> uh, english druidic <laughs> <laughs> architecture uh, but kura when sinbad and kura arrive kura summons the cyclops really he, he i think he calls on the demons of darkness oh, right. and sinbad says well they're not coming and then you hear the <laughs> clop again yes and but the shadow and the shadow yeah. again <laughs> This time we know what's coming. But this time, the, the Cyclops fights with a griffin. A griffin, is it? griffin yeah. yeah. Now this is... Now is that a, the body of a lion and the... Is it just... Is it the head and wings of an eagle or is it the head of a... Something and the wings of a uh, penguin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <it's> just, <laughs> um, <laughs> feet yeah. of a penguin. The, <laughs> the head of a mouse. No. You know, I saw just a, a completely separate point, but I saw this excellent documentary a while ago on BBC4 Yeah. about the origins of these... Greek m- monsters, oh, right. so like manticores and so on. Yeah, yeah. They they're very similar to uh, dinosaurs that lived in those areas. Like he says, the manticore could well be a triceratops or something. I can't remember. Right. It made perfect sense at the yeah, time. Yeah. I thought, wow, yeah, that's so right because this dinosaur laid eggs. Right. So they thought it's a bird. Right. But it also had, you know, it had four legs. Mm. They found the bones of it, and so yeah, they sort of yes. built a picture of what oh, this monster okay. was. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, but, but in this film... Yeah, I mean, the, the griffin is supposed to be the guardian of the fountain. Right. Yeah. And originally, Harryhausen wanted it to be a statue that comes to life. Yeah. Which would have been brilliant, actually. So the statue's there. Yeah. And when the fountain is disturbed, by right. maybe by evil or, yeah. or by anyone, it comes to life. Of course, that would have been the third statue that comes to life <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> in the film. But Harryhausen was disappointed that, for whatever reason, I don't know if it was time or budget or whatever, he had to have it just 
walking on, as it were. Yeah, yeah it does, certainly doesn't feel like you've been told by the Oracle that the forces of good and evil will fight. No. But it just feels as like, oh... Because it just comes along. They just come on stage and fight, yeah. you know. Yeah. But also this is, of course, the point where Kura slashes its leg while it's fighting. Right, And yeah. this is the deeds of mortal men influencing the... Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. The uh, battle between good yeah, and evil. Yeah, he strikes its hind leg, yeah. weakening it, and the, the Cyclops wins. is yes. able to win. So then Sinbad fights the Cyclops. Yeah, and it's quite as you, you, it's quite a vicious fight. Yes. Sinbad get, manages to get on the back of the Cyclops, basically yeah. stabs it again and again yeah, yeah. until it dies. And that's one thing, perhaps limitation of, of Dynamation, but, but also it's quite well done, is, is when you have to have that much interaction. Yeah. And that's one thing Harryhausen did, was he put live action with these mm. um, animated creatures yes, yeah. fairly seamlessly, yeah. um, especially for the time. But one of those limitations is, I mean, obviously they have to be filmed separately, but then when they interact so closely, you have to have a model. So Sinbad yes. becomes a model. Yeah. But it's still brilliant. Yeah, um, yes. But as you say, he's stabbing it in the back. <laughs> and you're actually yeah, pretty vicious. And, and it finally dies. Yes. So then there's the fight with Kura. <clears throat> yes. Um, the third fight <laughs> in a row. And at this point, Kura gets the Shield of Darkness, which oh, turns yeah, out yeah. to be really invisibility. Um, he starts with a sort of shield-sized chunk taken out of him, and then it grows until he's entirely invisible. Yeah. And then his sword disappears. And yes. So Sinbad's trying to fight yeah. something he can't see. Yeah. But then he goes into the the fountain, and Kura, Kura, does. Kura leaps into the oh, right, very yeah. middle of the fountain yeah. and you can see him as where the water isn't. Yes. You basically see him as a sort of silhouette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's able to kill Yeah, him. so Sinbad kills him, the fountain turns to blood. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so there's one tablet left, which Sinbad puts in, and then there's the crown of untold riches, which, of course, Sinbad could take for himself. Yes. But instead he gives it to the vizier. Yeah. Who, as soon as the vizier puts it on his head, he's transformed, he's healed, basically. He His becomes, mask disappears, yeah. dissolves, and, and there he is as he was. Yeah. And we finally get to see the face of Douglas Wilmer. <laughs> yeah, right at the end. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, very good. And, of course, I think Caroline Monroe actually says, you know, why didn't you take it? And yeah. he says, oh, you know, why didn't you could become king or something yes, like that. Yeah. And he says, well, yeah, but I could never be free. A king is yeah. never free. So another a sort of a, a moral of the story as it were yeah but in Sinbad in this is sort of he's not really involved in the the core meaning of the quest you know he's not after power he's no. after you know if he can get some riches as he goes along yeah he's sort yeah. of just like an adventurer so he's never dragged into the into the dangerous area where he's tempted by you know the power or the riches or whatever which no. we get in the other films where people yeah go wrong because they they want the gold or they want yeah. to be thought a god or a king, mm. you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's got all the attributes of a true hero. Yes, uh, yeah. You know, he's brave, um, but he's also moral. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and he's sort of disinterested. Uh, not not meaning he's not interested, but I mean, yeah. he, like a policeman is supposed to be yes. <laughs> disinterested. He doesn't right. have a, a, a stake, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a way... This does sort of contribute to the film being perhaps not as deep as some of the others. Yeah, it's just it's just a kind of I don't want to call it a one level adventure. I mean, yeah. And if it is, it's, there's nothing wrong with that, of course, because it's it's an incredibly exciting and well made film. Yeah, a brilliant adventure film. It is sort of all on the surface. I mean, you don't really have any appreciation that Sinbad has got any psychological problems. No. He's just a sort of happy-go-lucky bloke who will fight and yeah. risk his life. Um, I mean, as with all these things, you could delve into it and bring up all kinds of meanings and psychology, yeah. but you'd be making them up, I think. <laughs> I mean, I think I saw something, someone had written a book about sort of Middle Eastern adventure and foreign policy for America. and. and oh. <laughs> Uh, and how some, um, Golden Voyage of Sinbad was, was one of the examples really? of... And I, I don't know if they genuinely believed that this film was actually um, some kind of metaphor for... <laughs> yeah, an allegory for <laughs> yeah, foreign relations. Exactly. <laughs> or if they were just sort of plastering it on. But anyway, I mean, you could do that, and yeah. that's a shame, because I don't think it's necessarily there. <laughs> no, no. I mean, there, there is. We've discussed some of the sort of ideas that are behind this film but yeah. they don't go that deep not no. not like some of the other films I and mean, i think this sort of goes back to what i was saying at the beginning where harryhausen is a fan yeah and really this is this film is a tribute to everything he loves mm. the um you know the myths and legends of the middle east the um fantastical elements yeah and just high adventure really yeah 
Um, and so you get that's almost all you get, and that's fantastic. It's not like she, which has ideas. Yeah, yeah. it's exploring an idea, or and the same with um, the man who would be king. And I mean, maybe it's close to Indiana Jones as well. Yeah, which again yeah. is is a tribute yeah. to those B movies. Yeah, um, that they loved, and it doesn't diminish it at all. No, it's no, fantastic, it's... but it just hasn't got that maybe that deeper dimension. Yeah. It feels like pure story, like a fairy tale. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it. And there's a moral, of course, um, which is fine. <laughs> yeah. Here it is written that the fountain of destiny lies within easy march. Yes. Where the gods smile upon mortal men. But I shall not enter that hallowed place empty-handed. For it is also written that he who places each of these tablets into the waters of the fountain shall receive in turn youth a shield of darkness, and best of all, a crown of untold riches. All this is my destiny. But I fear your destiny lies before you, for have you not destroyed their most precious shrine? May Allah receive you. I bid you farewell. Uh, anything else to add about the film? Or... Uh, I think it's an excellent film. I mean, it's yeah. one of those ones that I've just known all my life. I can't remember seeing it at the cinema, although I sort of feel as I did. Yeah, I, I wonder was... if we did. I mean, 1974, I was five, you were three, I guess, yeah. and possibly could have. But, of course, back then they showed films again Yeah. a couple of years later, and, and so we could have seen it on a rerun, mm. or maybe we saw it on TV, but then yeah. films took a long time to come out on TV. Yeah, although once they did they were shown quite a lot. But I think we saw it quite early, I mean, certainly I'm sure we saw it before Star Wars or mm. so I think we probably saw it at the cinema. Yeah. I mean, I might be, I'm pretty sure I did see the, the follow-up which is Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. Yeah. Um, and I might just be sort of conflating the two of them you know because yes yes that's true which was quite obviously, easy to mix that was still up. 70s but it was uh 77 70, yeah. well, the same year as star wars actually and we saw we did see a version of the thief of baghdad at cinema it wasn't the 1941 yes and i haven't i i wanted to while i was looking up sinbad stuff mm-hmm. i kind of diverted to try and look up this not very deeply and so i didn't find it i'm sure if, if you know a few more minutes i'd find it i don't know if you remember it but it was it was definitely the thief of baghdad yeah <laughs> it had I think it was Roddy McDowell, yes, of yeah, Planet of the Apes and stuff. I'm in... sure I've seen it recently enough to. Oh, I don't think I've seen it again since seeing yeah. it that. So I'd, I'd like to actually. It's probably awful. Yeah. I think we saw it with. It was a double bill with Spider Man, <laughs> at some 1970s Spider Man film. Yeah. Which uh, wasn't there a TV series of that Spider Man as well? Yeah, and maybe that was a TV thing packaged yeah. for a film. Yes. I think it was bad. Yeah. Um. Anyway, yeah, I don't remember much about it. But those were the days when you you could go and see two films yes. back to back. That was the <laughs> which one's on. But uh, I do remember enjoying A Thief of Baghdad, but I don't remember. Yeah, and there's only one bit I can remember, which is them going through this cavern, and it was strangely lit, and they had to keep to the rocks or fall in or something. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm going to look that up after this and and see if I can find out more about it. Yes, yeah. Um, so yes, we don't know whether we saw it at cinema, but it's one of those Sunday afternoon films that. Yeah. If you catch it, you'll always watch. Cause yeah, it's just yeah. great. But yeah, so that's our tenth adventure film. Yes, that's all of them. We've done them all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know what we've learned, but we shall find out. Because I think we're gonna. Well, we are. We're yeah. going to do an eleventh podcast. Yes, yeah. And we're going to do an overview yeah. of perhaps. We're not going to look at each film again, of course. No. But we'll see. We'll perhaps see if we can come up with any conclusions or a sense yeah. of what makes a good adventure. Uh, themes, I guess, mm. that have run through. Because um, originally you said these were ten films that you came up with when you thought of adventure. Yes. But you weren't sure why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been a bit fuzzy, uh, and I probably still will be to the end, actually. Yeah. But, yeah, what makes these adventure rather than, say, you know, a war film would be or, or a fantasy film would yeah. be? There's something about these that are kind of that classic, which is what I'm interested in and and kind of informs my own work with Rainbow Orchid as well. It's that, this is what I'm after. I'm chasing that, <laughs> that oh, that's, that's such a good adventure that I really feel I've been on as well. That's what I want to do. So these are the films that I look to that give me that feeling and I want to recreate. 
and I want to know why. Yes. <laughs> so that'll be next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not next week. <laughs> Tomorrow. Um, and we'll also probably talk about a few other films that I didn't include yes. in the list. I mean, yeah. this was a fairly arbitrary list, although they are, as I've said before, quite perennial favourites. I mean, I, if I did it again, I, I don't think I'd come up with a different list. Mm. Um, and there's no particular order to them. Yeah. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some other films that sort of skirt around this ten and, and that could have been in there or yeah. or might make the next five or something, whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Cause, yes. Um, I, I'll probably have to listen to a few of our podcasts and see what... <laughs> see what we've said and and what keeps reoccurring actually yes, which should be interesting yeah. so yes well uh, thank you very much for listening to the the 10th adventure film podcast and as ever please do leave some comments on the blog if you if you there's anything you want to add or say or or anything oh, you disagree oh. with or we've got wrong yes <laughs> please do <laughs> corrections welcome yes yes <laughs> and um uh, thank you very much and we'll see you with the next one bye, bye.